Stanford University. Welcome. Welcome to Stanford Medicine's Contemplation by Design Summit. I'm Dr. Tia Rich, founder and director of Contemplation by Design. It's my great honor to introduce tonight's speaker, the Reverend Dr. Lauren Artris. She'll be speaking to us tonight on the wisdom of the labyrinth, its history, mystery, and modern uses. The Reverend Dr. Lauren Artris is the author of Walking a Sacred Path, Sacred Path Companion, and the Sand Labyrinth Kit, and has been cited in over 50 books she is an honorary canon at Grace Cathedral, San Francisco, in acknowledgement for her innovative worldwide work with the labyrinth as a spiritually integrative tool. In 1996, Lauren created Veriditas, a nonprofit dedicated to introducing people to the healing meditative powers of the labyrinth. She travels worldwide, offering workshops and lectures on the labyrinth, on the spiritual hunger of our times, and on psycho-spiritual topics such as forgiveness, self-acceptance, finding your life's purpose, and reconciliation. She is also inspired by and an expert on Hildegard of Bergen. In addition to Lauren's ordination as an Episcopal priest, she is a spiritual mentor and is a licensed MFT psychotherapist, focusing on the creative process, psycho-spiritual issues, and helping others find their soul assignments. She is the creator of a radio show on voiceamerica.com called, quote, The Wisdom of the Labyrinth, and is co-director of the Art of Spiritual Direction at Wisdom University. Lauren is a diplomat in the American Association for Pastoral Counselors and a clinical member of the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapists. She sits on the editorial board of the Presence Magazine, published by Spiritual Directors International. She is joined tonight by cellist Dr. Rob Hodges. He is a labyrinth designer and builder and a trained facilitator of labyrinth walking. He holds his PhD in ethnomusicology. We warmly welcome Dr. Lauren Artris and Dr. Rob Hodges. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and welcome all. Welcome everyone. We're delighted that you're here this evening uh, in this wonderful program, uh, Contemplation by Design, where we're looking at practices and uh, all sorts of ways of being able to really nourish our inner being, quiet our mind, open our hearts, all of that. And so tonight we're looking at the wisdom of the labyrinth, 
Uh, it's mystery, it's history, mystery and meaning, and also modern uses. And tonight, uh, I'll be showing you a PowerPoint for some of the basic information. And then we'll be ending, uh, and we'll hear Rob again with his lovely cello, as we do a, uh, a handheld labyrinth meditation together. So that will be our, our plan for this evening as well. So let me share my screen here as I begin. Beginning with our, our labyrinths here, and we'll do an overview. And so we'll just uh, take a moment to let this come into our minds. There's always one quote that I like uh, to focus our attention. And that is this quote by Jeff Sayward, throughout the long history of labyrinths, Whenever and wherever society is going through rapid change and development, the labyrinth has blossomed. And I think there's no um, debate anymore about the fact that we are going through rapid change, hopefully development. And um, during this time, uh, it's human nature, thank heavens, uh, to find a way um, through and to find a way to be able to help ourselves. Uh, it happens unconsciously, I believe. And this is what's really behind uh, the labyrinth movement uh, that has been going on and does go on in periods of history. We're going to go back and visit the uh, Gothic period, especially uh, during this evening. Just a moment here. So let's start with the history. And um, I've allowed myself to put some words to this because you're not going to be able to uh, remember or see if without reading it as well. So we'll take time to do that. But this is actually one of the earliest labyrinths we know about. It's from New Grange. It's called the Triple Spiral, the Tri Spiral. Sometimes it's re referred to as a triple goddess. Uh, and it's dated back to 3200. Uh, BCE. And this is in the context, this is at New Grange, where there is this uh, temple, uh, unearthed um, building that has been around since that time, that does match up with the, uh, the summer solstice, I believe it is, at that time. The first labyrinths, um, take a moment to look at these four different labyrinths, uh, but based around the petroglyphs. And that's part of the mystery. We don't know where these designs came from, folks. So uh, the one in Galatia, uh, uh, Northwest Spain, around 2000 BCE, the petroglyph in Valcomonia, Italy, uh, 750 BCE. Um, one of the strange things is that, you know, folks, there weren't any email attachments in those days. So the question about how does this uh, propagate through the world in many different places, as you'll see here in the second slide, the early labyrinths. Here we are in Pilos, Greece, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, Syria, on uh, pottery, uh, Rock Valley, England on the lower left, and we're not sure of that age, and also Lucinia, uh, Sardinia. Um, the reason we're not sure of the age on the two on the bottom is that there's a tradition with the Celtic labyrinths uh, especially Rock Valley, England would be a good representation of the Celtic labyrinths. Uh, the tradition was that every year they would go back and carve it into a rock. Now, this is not a large labyrinth. This is about six inches across. And they would carve it in, literally, religiously, um, in some, uh, some ritual done yearly. And that's why we can't carbon date it, because we can carbon date the last time it was the molecules were moved, but we can't carbon date the first time. So that's why we're not quite certain of some of these. <clears throat> Moving through time toward us into the present, uh, present, there's the Greek and Roman labyrinths. And here's a coin from Gnosis on the left, and that is dated around 300 BCE. Roman floor mosaic, these are small mosaics, they're still there, they're in a museum in Portugal. Uh, associated with the, most of the foyer of a house, walking into a house, they were understood to be a way of um, inviting protection, inviting protection for your guests, inviting protection for you, the owners of the house. And so that theme uh, you'll hear uh, throughout and is associated with labyrinths. 
This labyrinth is a, also a, a Roman labyrinth. Um, it's uh, what I would call a linear labyrinth in the fact that you know where you are when you're walking it. Now, this is mosaic. This is a, a small. I have not walked this labyrinth, but I know if you take a moment to trace my cursor here, you're walking this quadrant around and around, and then you're here and you're here, and then you duplicate it, and then you duplicate it. And then you duplicate it, and then you know you're going to go into center. The center here has a bull's head in it. Um, often people, uh, I think, mistake this for the Minotaur. The Minotaur is associated with labyrinths, and you'll see uh, that in a little bit here. Uh, but this actually was from the Mitis culture. It was a matriarchal culture that was taken over by the Roman Empire. And so I, and someone who's itching to do research, this would be a great place to start to look into that for sure. It's always important to differentiate between a labyrinth and a maze. And this is a maze, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, it's huge uh, and it's definitely broken up paths, cul-de-sacs, dead ends, forced turns uh, where you can't go except there's a dead end, so you have to turn around. This is what it looks like from the level of walking it. So mazes often uh, have over the head uh, ways of, of hiding the path. And you can see there's choices here. There's a path to the left here, and the path to the right, just a moment here, uh, path here, it's a dead end. You've got to go one way or the other. See, so a maze is actually a cognitive puzzle. Uh, a labyrinth is not that at all. Uh, you could say a maze is designed for you to lose your way. A labyrinth is designed for you to find your way. A labyrinth that works brings in a quieting of the mind, uh, a sense of embodiment. And you'll see as we go further uh, that they're used in many different ways. Take a moment to remember that maze just a second ago, and then look at this. Isn't this a lovely labyrinth? This is a seven circuit classical labyrinth. We'll be mostly focusing on the Chart labyrinth tonight, uh, but this is another form of labyrinth. It's earlier. This, this design is four to 5,000 years of age uh, that we know, and maybe perhaps even earlier it'd be, uh, on, on the ground. That's our petroglyphs first, and then they got larger and larger and then moved to the ground. This is done by an artist, um, Marion Ilwalt. Uh, in Germany. I just, I just think it's lovely. There's also this kind of rumor that you, you, labyrinths have to be expensive, and they don't. They really can be made of very unnatural things, natural objects. And then this is the more complicated, more complex Chart labyrinth. <clears throat> this happens to be in Chart Cathedral in France. Um, I think one of the important things that people don't realize is that the Chart labyrinth has been closed probably since the French Revolution, that would be 1792, 93, and perhaps even earlier. Uh, during and, and as a result of the French Revolution, these cathedrals throughout France became temples of reason. And so they are, the whole of the Roman Catholic Church was dispersed from France and these uh, great cathedrals were used uh, for temples of reason. And they had different rituals uh, that um, some people feel are, are terrible. Saturnia is one of the rituals uh, that happened uh, during those times. This is Shark Cathedral renewed. Um, the back uh, here, I spend quite a bit of time in this cathedral yearly. Uh, the back end here, uh, you can see it's much darker. They put oil uh, heating in in 1991 and it really affected all the stone. And so they're redoing it. Now they have finished this actually. So this is possibly the earliest Christian labyrinth. In the center is a big word salad kind of thing, a word a square uh, that spells uh, uh, um, Sanctus Ecclesia, uh, Sanctus Ecclesia meaning Holy Church. And here's a little bit of a hint <laughs> of the Minotaur and Ariadne's thread here. So now these manuscripts, um, as I mentioned, there was no email attachment. So how did people know about labyrinths? Uh, and that is one of the mysterious elements of labyrinths, that they occur throughout the world. 
uh, and we don't know why or how. One of the theories from Sig Lonergan is that he that the he believes that the uh, classical labyrinth, which you just saw that lovely one in the in the park in Germany, comes from the trail tracking the planet of Mercury, one solid uh, cycle of a year. That's the theory. Uh, but then where else did these designs come from? When you think about the early sailors, the early people who navigated the oceans, they took their signs from the stars. So these manuscript labyrinths were another way of circulating uh, this design throughout Europe. These actually uh, are, are early on, the 11th, sorry, upper left-hand corner, early on uh, 11th Circuit Medieval. This is in Saint-Germain-du-Pré in Paris uh, in the early 900s. The one on the right is the Sixth Circuit Medieval uh, uh, Labyrinth in Abington in 1030. The lower left, again, that's, you can hardly see it, but they, again, it's the Minotaur, it's Theseus slaying the Minotaur, uh, the 11th Circuit Medieval Labyrinth from the early 1100s. And you see in the last one, be 1280, you see these manuscripts uh, were, um, a, these, this design in the manuscripts was actually a, a popular a thing for a scribe to do. They had to write everything accurately in, when they're scri um, uh, scribing, writing and duplicating a manuscript, but they had freedom uh, where the in the corners of the pages and the, that these are a sample of what they did. And again, here you see the Minotaur uh, perched there for sure. This is um, just a simple overview. There were 23 labyrinths that went up in France during the Middle Ages. Again, this is one of the, what would be called the Gothic revival uh, of, of labyrinths. And about between 1270, uh, maybe a little earlier, 1250 to, uh, excuse me, 1150 to 1250, around that time, many labyrinths went in. Uh, and they all were the same design, 11th circuit labyrinths, uh, not necessarily the chart style, but I'll show you what I mean by that. And so down the dates here, 1134, Exer's 1160, uh, you can see Array's Portier, San, uh, San Quentin, Chart, and only three exist now. Chart in its original form. I will show a, a rather inferior photo of San Quentin, but it's partly because it's in such bad shape. Uh, but just to give you a sense of this, uh, that labyrinths uh, were not one kind of thing that Chart Cathedral did. Amiens Cathedral, this, is, uh, this was actually torn up in uh, 1825 and restored in 1894. We're not quite sure the impetus to behind that, but you can see this labyrinth being the centerpiece of, of the cathedral. Uh, the floor is rather confusing. I was there with a curator one time and I said, what's the floors mean? He, oh, well, he just says, oh, earth, air, fire, and water, as though that were just one of the things that the way people think uh, <laughs> then they did, but not now. Again, this is uh, Amiens, uh, it's in very, very inky black, blue kind of uh, marble as well as the white marble. It's confusing. I had a choice when I put the labyrinth in Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. This is one of the choices I had. But the center, the main thing, I it was confusing to the eye. The path is as black and as wide as the field, which is the white path between the between the labyrinth uh, paths, and that is kind of confusing. If you want to walk a labyrinth, walk the black. If you want to walk a maze, walk the white. Um, and also, and mostly, the center is small and the center is off center. We do not need that as a symbol right now with so much off centered. One of the things the labyrinth is offering as a practice is a great solid center, not only outside of us, but helps us build a center inside of ourselves. This is the photo of Ami of uh, San Quentin, but the floor is heavily damaged and it's open um, sometimes, but it, you just feel guilty walking it because you're, you know, you're not helping the stone whatsoever. And here we are in Grace Cathedral. Uh, this was put in the limestone and marble labyrinth, uh, replaced a canvas. We started in canvas. We moved to a tapestry rug 
And then now in 2007, we put this in as well. So here we are at Chartres Cathedral, and I want to um, bring Chartres Cathedral in because this is where the labyrinth that we put in Grace Cathedral, and you just saw that, uh, is from Chartres Cathedral. Now, I mentioned about the labyrinth being closed, and it has chairs on it even now as we speak. Uh, Fridays, they now open it to uh, the people who want to walk the labyrinth. Um, that's been long in coming. We first, I first walked into Shark Cathedral in uh, literally August 5th, 1991, knowing it was covered by chairs, writing and writing and asking for permission to be able to uh, walk the labyrinth. And we didn't realize no one, no rector was at the helm at that point. Uh, so a small band of us uh, came to Shark Cathedral. Uh, including our dean, and uh, we found some comfort in that. He did speak some French as well, and and we moved the chairs. We moved 256 chairs, and uh, it was no small endeavor. And um, when I look back on it, I, it was a pretty gutsy thing to do. But really, it, the the labyrinth, I think, was if I can use this term, begging to be opened. And so many people come up to me and say, well, I've been in Shark Cathedral. I haven't seen any labyrinth. I'm sorry, this keeps slipping around here a little bit. I haven't seen any labyrinth in Shark Cathedral and you wouldn't notice it. First of all, your eye is directed up to the amazing collection of 12th and 13th century windows, uh, but also you wouldn't know what to look for because of the chairs. And this is another example of the chairs just covering it. So you really would not know. And this as well. These are the lunations on the outer edge. So this picture is from the roof of the cathedral in Chartres, uh, 92, yard, 92 meters up. Uh, and you can see the whole of the labyrinth here. The two kind of arrow-like things on the side are the pillars uh, of the cathedral. And so you can see it in its entirety here. And what makes the Chartres Labyrinth unique from another 11 circuit labyrinth, although this is an 11 circuit labyrinth, the reason I'm using the word circuit is there's this one path, remember it's not a maze, one path that goes around the center 11 times. Um, and so, and what's unique about this is the lunations, the custom foils that go around the outer edge here. Um, and also the petals, <clears throat> the six petals in the center. <clears throat> the way it's understood, if you are, are in the Christian context, that it would be the six days of creation or um, the whole sense of New Jerusalem or even more accurate, uh, petals, flowers. <clears throat> Lilies, a lily would have six petals. A rose would have five. So take a moment to look at this because this is also what we have in our printout. Um, for you to use tonight. It's a rather dramatic picture to have it cut in like that through the roof. And here it is on the floor. Some people think that this labyrinth is just kind of etched in, you know, a second afterthought or something. And there is a debate when it went in. We think 1201 is the closest date we can come to. But it's not in any way a, an afterthought or uh, something that was easily done. This stonework is ph phenomenal. It's really amazing. This is now 800 years old, older than 800 years old. And um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that it survived is because the uh, quality of the stone, they found a, a quarry in 1148, and then they began to build what was then, by that time, the third, maybe even the fourth cathedral. The other three had burned. Um, and then the stone came into their lives and it hardens over the centuries. So that's why this is in its original form and in good shape, it's walkable. The center, you can see kind of a big scar here. Well, that's true. This is one of the pieces of uh, war damage from the French Revolution. This centerpiece, this plaque, was made out of uh, brass, lead, and copper, and was pulled up to be made in the cannonballs. So that Chartres Cathedral has not had a lot of war damage, but that is certainly a part of it. And then again, look at this entrance. This is the threshold. 
And when you step into the threshold, you uh, begin your walk. And there's a definite, definitely a difference of standing outside the threshold and stepping over the threshold into the labyrinth. You can think of the labyrinth as a path of prayer, a walking meditation, a watering hole for the spirit, uh, a reflection for a mirror for the soul. There's so many ways, a resting place for your soul. There's so many ways of understanding uh, the labyrinth and you are the one invited to understand it in your own way. This is an early uh, wood print. It's dated 1750. Um, there's some discussion about that. You can see the rude screen in the back, which was uh, early on one of the ways that the uh, Roman church kept people out of the Holy of Holies, only the only the um, kings and the prominent people, uh, and of course the bishop and the clergy could be back there. And then that was eventually torn up. But the labyrinth is definitely a people's tool. It's definitely a people's uh, for the people, uh, uh, peasants and, and whomever uh, would want to come and be at present. But this is one of the few documentations we have that the, the labyrinth has actually walked in the cathedral. Let's talk about the mystery a bit and the meaning of the labyrinth. This is actually a photo I took when I was, usually we leave Chart early on at 4 a.m. in the morning to get up to Charles de Gaulle to fly out. I just walked out of where I was staying and caught this, I don't know what that is, Jupiter, some sort of star, perhaps moon. Um, but it relays to me some of the mystery and the mystery of the path, the journey, the way. One of the biggest fears that humans have is getting lost. Isn't that interesting? Getting lost. And um, you can get that feeling in the labyrinth. It's a path that seems to lead on and on and on. And where is this going? Where is this going? Now, it was also used for the pilgrims. Um, Chartres Cathedral had a very, very famous veil and it's called the, uh, the Veil of Mary. And it was given to the cathedral by Charles the Bald in 871, and then became a very popular uh, place of pilgrimage. And the pilgrims, uh, this represents the three faiths, the three Abrahamic faiths, um, uh, all embraced pilgrimage as a way of going to the holy city, Jerusalem, or Benari, or Mecca, uh, as a way of, of walking, uh, and being present. And then when uh, it became dangerous to travel because of the crusades going throughout Europe, uh, these labyrinths in the different cathedrals became a symbolic walk uh, to the new Jerusalem. And so the center of the labyrinth, one, one understanding of it is that you've reached the new Jerusalem, which for those of you who may not be in the Christian tradition understand that that's kind of the vision of what it means. If we ever, ever on this earth came to an understanding that we could love one another and share our resources, well, that would be very much like the beginning of the kingdom of, of God, and that's a Christian term, of course. The pilgrims wore a badge. They actually had a badge, and you can see these little circles that was sewn into your hat or into your lapel, so you could flash this badge, no kidding. You could flash it if you were being approached by a thief, you could flash the badge and that went, I better not bother with this person. Mary is protecting him. Mary, the Theotokos. Um, and so, so this was quite popular. Uh, it lost a tradition and they found this, one of these badges, this is a duplicate obviously, um, up in the mud in Paris in the 1800s and started researching it and tracing it back. And it has, again, carrying the, this shirt or the veil, the holy veil. Uh, of Mary. So our modern uses, here we are, Grace Cathedral on the labyrinth I showed you. Uh, and this is the women's dream quest. Um, this is Judith Tripp. Uh, it's an overnight for, in Grace Cathedral. It's the only one ever offered uh, every year. It is coming up November 18th, by the way, uh, for, I'm sorry, for women only, but uh, it's a really wonderful evening in the cathedral. 
you literally sleep overnight. You bring your sleeping bag and all. And it's always ecologically focused. You can see here, there's this uh, large earth. It's, I think, an inflated uh, balloon there uh, that they're moving around. It's ritual, it's dance, it's labyrinth walking, uh, it's uh, chanting, it's small group work. It's quite a lovely, lovely ritual, a ritual evening. Here's a um, modern day labyrinth experience. This is actually in the fluorescent light, uh, you know, one of these great big projectors that they use in theater. And then they put a template on the light. Um, and so this is uh, just kind of a temporary labyrinth. Obviously, if you switch the light off, you don't have a labyrinth. Uh, there's one problem with this, uh, and that is uh, that if there's a lot of people walking it, uh, you wind up blocking out the path for someone else. Now there's one teaching about the labyrinth that you use everything as a metaphor of, that happens to you in the labyrinth. How's that for a metaphor? Your shadow is obscuring my path. Ouch, that can be a really tough metaphor for some folks. This is a black and white labyrinth by Jim Buchanan. It's actually a, a paper mache models. Uh, and then uh, later I've seen one like this adding a wheelchair. Um, and this is just an art piece. This is, it's a walkable labyrinth, yes. This is also, again, to the technique of casting light under the floor. Um, but more, it's more, it's a visual, and it really is quite beautiful, isn't it? So here we are. Um, this is uh, in Grace Cathedral again. This is called the Grace of Light. Um, and it's actually broadcast from, again, one a very powerful projector onto the floor. And then what happens is uh, you go literally and lay down in the center of the labyrinth and they give you a little head pillow and you're looking up into the light and then it's a light show. It's quite lovely. I believe they're beginning to do that again uh, since COVID. Of course, it stopped, we, uh, but uh, they're beginning to do that again. So again, other uses of the labyrinth, modern day uses of the labyrinth. I also want to comment on the fact that this labyrinth, um, what happened is then labyrinths began to morph. I mean, people find their creative instincts and they say, oh, I'd love to make a labyrinth for and so there is such a whole other category uh, called contemporary labyrinths. This would be one contemporary labyrinth, but this has a special history. This one that we laid out is in the grounds of St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town, South Africa. I was there several years ago. We were working with this and it's called the Reconciliation Labyrinth. Now, there are certain dangers in calling a labyrinth by a name like that because you can set up expectations. But really, if you name this uh, what it is, it's a two-path labyrinth. And it was created right after apartheid and during the healing period. And of course, I think they're always healing, but that very fragile time, uh, the creator of this, Claire um, Wilson, uh, worked at a tech school with uh, folks who were black, who were uh, colored, uh, mixed races. And there they said, you know, in the main metaphor of the labyrinth, it, we're all on the path together. That's really a powerful metaphor for most of us. But in South Africa, they did not feel they were on the same path. Uh, they had to sacrifice their education for liberation, and that was, in fact, uh, their phrase, uh, liberation before education. And so she's working at this tech school and created this two-path labyrinth. These are mirror images. If you walk into the left, you're turning left and walking here. If you walk into the right, you're turning right and walking here. There's a meeting point up here. And when I was using this as kind of a special labyrinth, I asked people to stop. People were role-playing. One, one was working with, okay, a critical parent, and the other person was rolled in the role, scowl, scowling at that person and as they walked. And then they meet, and I asked them to look at each other in the eyes for five seconds. And then they, then they walk the other person's path, and that's the main metaphor here. 
So, uh, so there's different labyrinths like this. This is by far one of the most uh, profound ones, the reconciliation labyrinth. When you get here, you're finished here, um, and you can meet the person you're working with and, and role playing with or feeling in, in an adversarial position with, and you have a choice to go to center, you have a choice to walk out, you have a choice to walk the labyrinth again. So, so um, one of the many, many uses of labyrinths are private labyrinths. There's hundreds and hundreds of private labyrinths that we don't even know about. We do have the labyrinth locator, uh, which is online, and you can just Google labyrinth locator or go through the Veritas website. But a th lot of private labyrinths, and this is a lovely one down in, in Georgia, um, just created for to be able to walk. It's about 30 feet of, across. Uh, and really just a lovely grass labyrinth with inlaid brick. The labyrinths are also used, this is the uh, Santa Rosa design. This is again, a contemporary labyrinth. Um, just for social gathering. This is at a, a, a society, labyrinth society gathering years ago. And it, people just experiment with different labyrinths, walk different labyrinths, uh, feel what they feel like, all of that. And also they're used symbolically. This was in 2008, uh, Grace Cathedral held uh, an exhibit. This is an art exhibit of, of soldiers' shoes representing people who were lost uh, in the Iraqi war. And, uh, and they have name tags on for different uh, uh, people who have lost their lives. You can see that there. You see, so they can also be used symbolically. And also they're just fun. They're just fun. This is a beautiful labyrinth, obviously temporary, <laughs> and um, done by a method called Ariadne's thread. You have to know the pattern well enough in your body to be able to walk it into the snow. There's other ways to do, this is a classical labyrinth. There's other ways to do classical labyrinths, but um, you have to walk across the snow, you see. To, so you wouldn't be using that way of doing it in the snow. I just love that. I think it's just so beautiful. And here again, um, this is a, a school uh, down in Texas. Uh, they're using it ritually. The man here is carrying a drum. Uh, people are walking it. Uh, and they made this labyrinth. They designed it, they painted it, and they made it. This would be, this is a classical seven circuit, so it would be an archetypal labyrinth. Uh, but the, the kids made it and then are walking it, which is just 100%. Can't get better than that. Also, um, labyrinths are made for community building. And so this is a garden labyrinth outside the train station in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. And it actually is interesting um, because it's about a 90 foot labyrinth. And this is in the old barracks uh, ground. After the Cold War ended, the city asked people what they'd like to do. Uh, what would you like to do with this land? And a group of folks came forward and said, we'd build a labyrinth. And the guidance is this field, I mentioned that word before, right, is very wide, four foot wide, and by eight foot long. And each uh, person or family unit has a, a garden there. And they also left the path, and the kids painted the stones all along here. Uh, that was their project. Uh, they left the path narrow enough to be an effective uh, um, way of meditating. If the path is too wide, you see that you lose your attention. But if the path is fairly narrow, uh, not restrictive, but fairly narrow, then that focuses the mind. Uh, and so this labyrinth has the best of both worlds on that way. Uh, uh, labyrinths are also uh, art pieces. This is a huge labyrinth. You can tell that by these folks here. Look how large they are. It's quite a distance. And this is actually a body of water flowing around this, what would be considered a three circuit labyrinth. Um, and so it's a beautiful art piece. Uh, and this again is by Jim Buchanan. And New Year's Day labyrinth. Um, this guy named Circle, Circle Man down in the Lacadia Beach in, outside of San Diego just one day decided to create a large labyrinth for New Year's Day and about 750 people turned up to walk it. We're looking for something special on New Year's Day, something experiential, something sort of spiritual. Um, so this is really actually a way, wonderful way of doing it. 
So let's take a moment to summarize a bit of, of what I'm saying with the benefits of walking a labyrinth. Uh, first of all, it, it quiets the mind. Um, I'm using a new term lately, though, because uh, I, I think when we think about quieting the mind, we think about it has to be absolutely still, you know, like a, just a still line, nothing happening. And that's not true. That's never true. Uh, so I'm thinking more of the term a soft mind, a soft mind. A soft mind is receptive. You take things in. And when you're walking the labyrinth, it's an open-eyed meditation. Uh, but when you're walking it soft-eyed and soft-minded, you're just taking in, receiving, the receptive archetype takes over. It provides a method, a method for self-reflection. Uh, it integrates the senses with thought and imagination. Uh, it provides an inner spaciousness. I think this is so important. You know, to, how do we get out of being reactive? How, how you know you can fly off the handle or you can speak too too roughly or bluntly or you know all of that and with the tension going up in the world and with people kind of mistrusting each other more and being more uncertain and just even being uncertain about being out among people uh, as a result of COVID to provide an inner spaciousness if you have a practice that does that it takes you out of reactivity in the receptivity. It takes you out of reactivity uh, into responsiveness. And there's just a second of moment there where you have a choice over how you respond. And that's what I mean by providing a sense of inner spaciousness. And I know we're exploring a lot of practices uh, in, through this wonderful summit. And so uh, to me, that's, these, are, these are the criterion of any uh, practice that you may choose. I've mentioned already a practice in receptivity, um, that you're really going with the flow uh, when you're walking a labyrinth and you're kind of in that place, just it's like a dance. You're just moving, moving through and allowing yourself then to, to just be seen, be seen there and be seen with soft eyes. Also, it deepens empathy and compassion. You get a sense of, we're all on this path together. We're all on this path together. And um, that we are, we're sharing space. Uh, we're sharing space, we're sharing resources. Uh, we're sharing the very air we breathe. We're, we found that out the hard way, haven't we? And so how do we really begin to open our hearts and our minds? Uh, that there's a new world coming and we want to be able to be as receptive as possible. So these are finger meditation tools and this is where we're headed. Uh, in a moment, uh, because we're doing well on time, I'll, I'll uh, stop for a moment and, and um, see if we have questions about this segment and then we'll have a brief break uh, and then we'll come back for our evening meditation. But these are finger meditation tools and um, I'll show you this one as well. This is a, uh, a sharp one, a 11 circuit labyrinth. This is actually made for uh, people and especially kids with uh, ADD and ADHD um, that you're using both hands. What it do is doing is balancing the brain. It's a patterning. Are you move using both hands, one in each labyrinth as you move through it? Uh, and uh, the early research on this really has said that this is, it's very helpful to be able to be calming and, and, and uh, come into yourself in a way that is calming and spacious. So let me, um, here's one more. Um, and we'll talk about finger meditation tools to get you ready for your meditation in a moment. So let me stop sharing my screen. So I'm uh, happy to take questions, whether in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand. Um, Lauren, if I may ask a follow on to the wonderful work you mentioned with ADHD and the two handed uh, finger labyrinth, where is that work being done? Uh, it's a man named Neil Young, uh, literally, and uh, his website is relax 
And then the number four, life, L-I-F-E, relaxforlife.com. Yes. Yeah. Um, and what about people making labyrinths for themselves? Can you speak to that? Right. Well, a lot of people do. <laughs> a lot of people do. Um, often the labyrinths that I'm happy to hear are being made are often often come to people through a dream or some kind of kind of otherworldly feel. Uh, they might come across a labyrinth on the ground, for instance, and just be totally captured by it. Um, but the whole sense of being able to uh, make your own labyrinth, maybe there's some design pressing at you. And what I'd encourage you to do is sit down, uh, sit down at a, your kitchen table and draw it out, start sketching it. You might be using a, a, a compass even um, to work with the circle of it. Um, and then if the labyrinth design feels right, uh, you probably, I'd encourage you to put it on something temporary. You might spray paint it on a lawn or put it on some butcher block paper. Uh, and then having some of your friends uh, walk it, uh, even use it as a finger meditation tool for a while. See, a, a labyrinth works when it allows you to quiet your mind or soften your mind. It allows you to receive your inner symbols. So it opens your symbolic world. So the labyrinth is a great place to do dream work. Um, but as you're, as you're doing this labyrinth, see if it does that. Does it quiet you? Does it open you? Um, and, and then you might also might find yourself bordering on going into looking at uh, sacred design. Uh, there's a lovely book, um, a mo models, let's see, I'm reading too many books right now, Michael, Michael Schneider, Schneider's um, figuring, figuring the Universe, or something like that. I'll have to look that up. Um, some of you labyrinth folks I see are on. I know you're on, Lars. Maybe you can put that in the chat. So, um, so yeah. So, so it's really an it really is an art form in itself. Yeah. Well, it's a great question. Thank you, Lisa, with that. It's, it is out there, that's for sure, that people on the more conservative side, um, who especially people who take the, the sacred scriptures, we're mostly talking about the Christian scriptures right now, uh, literally. Uh, and so with literalism, you can't allow metaphor. Uh, you, you see, you, you know, you, you, the letter of the law, and that's the way it is. So if you say, you know, wow, it rained so heavily last night, it rained cats and dogs, they would see cats and dogs being rained down, you see. So the world, their world is, is very um, focused ar around not allowing or not welcoming metaphor. Uh, and, and that's part of it. Another part of it is the labyrinth invites us to go inward. Uh, this is why it's such a wonderful uh, tool and practice for people who are activists out into the world. You know, we need a foot in both worlds, folks. The outer world, our, our action on behalf of the planet, on behalf of our communities, but also on the inner world that we need to know ourselves well enough uh, to be able to see where we fail, where we have, have foibles, where we don't treat people well, all of that. And you see, to look inward in, in the very conservative churches is uh, not a good thing. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, right. It's actually, you know, you're not supposed to have doubt. You're not supposed to have questions, you see. And that fits right into that, unfortunately. Good, that's wonderful. And it is, that, that's true. I've, um, some of you have often heard me call myself a failed meditator, right? <laughs> because a sitting meditation, you know, I can't quiet my mind. But when you move your body and even your hand and your finger, uh, when you're moving that, you're discharging energy and, and that quiets the mind much, much easier. And we're training people daily in that, you know, we really are. And we, and we do that because the labyrinth is considered in the trauma community, a sensory integrator. 
it's a it's a beautiful beautiful tool for that. Let me also mention now uh, that we put in the chat that if you want to use a finger labyrinth uh, from a uh, free app on your phone or iPad, it's a Mount Mojo, a labyrinth journeys, and it's in the it's in the chat. And um, you can just download it, it's free, and you can use it for our meditation as well. So you can get that on your break. It just takes a few seconds to download. There are three-dimensional labyrinths, yes, there are. Um, Sandra Wasco Flood is someone who designs some of those. Um, I have not, I don't know where I, I could name anyone right now. Uh, you also might want to look on the Labyrinth Locator and you might come across some. And there are some old Baltic ones, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which were built on hills and mm -hmm. you made your way up to the top of the hill. Uh, I think they were part of fishing communities, if I remember <laughs> uh, rightly, but they're quite old in the Baltic world, maybe in Greenland as well some uh, hill, hillside labyrinths. Thanks, Rob. It would give that feel of going upward. I actually think there are some modern day uh, ones uh, as well. So if you know of any dip, uh, anyone here, put it in the chat for sure. So let's take a five minute break and I'll see you at eight o'clock, okay? Okay. As we're coming back, there were a couple of uh, questions that I didn't get to uh, finish on the chat and when our break um the person that mentioned about the uh, black and white if you walk on the amian labyrinths that you walk the white path to walk a maze the black path to walk a labyrinth no that is unique only to that labyrinth and that is also why it's confusing and that's also why i chose the chart labyrinths <clears throat> over the amian labyrinth so just to be clear on that so good. And someone also asked about the return path, but that takes us right into our, our handheld labyrinth. So, so I think we're, are we pretty much here? Yeah, I hope so. Um, so hold up the labyrinth that you're going to use. That's always fun to see. Wow, there's some serious labyrinth folks here already. Uh, not, not everybody's holding up just paper or other. Uh, great. Wonderful. Good. Well, and they're mostly sharp, and that's fine if they're not. That's okay. We've sort of focused on the uh, 11th Circuit Medieval Labyrinth. Um, and that's what happened to me. But, uh, Tia, when you asked about uh, labyrinths and if you have a drawing, a contemporary one, when I saw the sharp labyrinth, uh, folks, it just was my labyrinth. It was a heart song. It was a discovery. It was just like, oh, okay, there it is. That's it. And so I'm not someone who searches. There are people, and 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 it is important. If you don't have a labyrinth that you like, you could say the labyrinth might not like you either. Find one that you like and that likes you. <laughs> so um, and then so that sends you on a journey. Go to the labyrinth locator. Look at all the different ways and doing labyrinths and the different styles, uh, contemporary and archetypal. Uh, archetypal is a, a folks, I have not defined that. What I mean by that is that it really has roots in history. Uh, it's one of the, the patterns we don't know where it came from. We can assume safely that it came from some religious tradition, even if it's we don't know which one it is. Also that it was uh, drawn and perfected uh, and, and perfected over time and passed down through the ages. And you saw the sixth century manuscripts of, of uh, the Chart Labyrinth beginning, the 11th Circuit Labyrinth. So, okay, I'm delighted, Rob. I'm delighted that you're going to be, uh, be uh, playing your cello during this meditation. And so with just a brief review, I, I think a lot of you have done uh, handheld labyrinth walks, but you want to warm your labyrinth in some way. I usually just kind of move my right hand around it as well, just to kind of greet it, say hello to it. Allow it to um, be present with you and you be present with it. And we think about the movement um, 
and just as a, what's sometimes called the threefold path or the three R's, uh, rele releasing, receiving, returning. And so someone asked a question about, about the return. Do you need to return? Um, you can walk and finger walk a labyrinth any way you want. One of the important things I think of any practice, uh, but it's easier to say about the labyrinth practice, you need to make it your own. You need to make it your own. And part of being, for me, being a failed meditator early on is I was always trying to practice someone else's method. So the labyrinth really invites you uh, to learn to use it. Just It's so easy to get familiar with. Uh, quickly, one or two walks and a couple handheld labyrinth walks. Um, and then do what you need to do. Uh, if you're walking, I always, if I'm in a hurry or something, I might just walk to the center. I was at Grace Cathedral yesterday and, you know, just walk to the center because I needed to settle myself before I introduced it to a group. You make it your own. But the threefold path or the releasing, you walk in as you're going in and in this handheld meditation, allow yourself just to kind of come home to yourself. Let yourself be present with yourself. Now, you need to show up. And that doesn't mean distraction doesn't show up, but then just draw yourself back. One of the ways to do that, a couple ways, actually, uh, some people, like in Christian centering prayer, uh, say a mantra, a repeated phrase. Sometimes a repeated phrase comes to you. And if that happens to me, I repeat the phrase and repeat it until it disappears. Uh, you can use your breath. That's the beauty of the labyrinth. You can use any meditation method that you've been taught in the past and apply it to the labyrinth. So you can use your breath as you're moving in. And also allowing yourself to move downward into the sensate level. Feel your finger on the path. Feel your finger on the path. Place your other hand as well, somewhere where you can feel the texture of the labyrinth. Just allowing yourself uh, that way. So um, the, at the center, uh, it's a sense of, okay, if you've released, come uh, really come home to yourself. Shed it all extraneous thoughts as much as you can. Uh, then at the center, just it, for me, it's just a quiet place. Uh, it's, it's subtle what you might receive. It's subtle. Uh, I, I often, I remember this one woman who came up to me and on the walking, after walking the labyrinth and said, you know, Nothing happened to me except I felt a deep sense of peace. You know? <laughs> okay, that's too bad. It was only that, right? <laughs> you see, so expectations also can get in the way. So just allow yourself to experience your experience. And then um, usually we teach to come out the same path that you went in. It's the same path. There's no different exit entrance. Uh, in most elaborates, um, and just coming back out. Now, when you're walking it, it's a two-way street. Here, you don't have to worry about that, uh, but you can meet yourself on the path as well. So, so um, uh, Rob, I think we have time for about uh, 13, 14 minutes of music, 15 even. Okay. Um, and then I would just say, if you complete your labyrinth walk, you might want to do it again. Uh, you hmm. See what you see what happens inside you. You might want to just enjoy and just melt yourself into the uh, lovely music. Um, and so um, at the end, we'll we'll come on back in. We'll have time for a few uh, reactions and sharings and, and responses. So so take a moment. Let yourself get settled in your chair. Oh, one deep breath. And then another. Just allow yourself to come in as you begin to hear the music. And then the final one.
Don't rush, let yourself hover with the feelings. Thank you, Rob. It was really lovely. My pleasure. So we have a few minutes here. I see some of you writing, which is absolutely fine. I see you put a heart up there. Great. <laughs> Brief reflections. Or um, you could put in the chat a word or two. That's always a wonderful thing to do. And I'll, I'll take a moment to read them and I, I put in the chat what's what's going on and Open a chat and see what we're saying here. Okay, it felt good. The rest in the center. That's lovely. Uh, there's a question about a, a Christian centering prayer. I'll come back to that. I feel a soft, vibrating energy throughout my body that was deeply enhanced by the music. Great. Amazing, just tracing an image on my iPad even felt very centering. Of course, would prefer to feel of, of wood, uh, laugh out loud, uh -huh. <laughs> but it works no matter what. <laughs> so. Collective presence, feeling that. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for another meditation option. There is something different in my body after doing this exercise. Uh, filled me with grace and mercy as I left. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important point. Um, that it's so important in our practices, whatever they are and whatever we choose. Uh, to involve the body, to bring the body in. Um, and, and there's so many wonderful, I mean, we live at a special time, folks, that we can connect around the world like this and that we can share our different methods. And 
uh, it's important to make sure that you're including the body. If you're not uh, walking daily, doing something that's active, uh, but an awareness and bringing your body into the, into the, the practice. Uh, we had a symposium yesterday at the Ritz Carlton for the Bay Area travel writers. And uh, we, we talked about dance uh, and, and then yoga on the labyrinth, which we do at Grace Cathedral, and then also, also labyrinth walking, all embodied practices. So if you're feeling like your life doesn't have traction to them right now, to it right now, bring the body in more. So I think we have just about uh, time for one or two comments. I do see others coming in. Perhaps I should just stay with this. The, the awareness that we're all doing this together across space and bringing awareness that people have done this across time. Yes, indeed. Yes. And that's the power of being able to connect uh, uh, on the internet and through Zoom and all. Um, uh, Barry, opening heart and sense of resilience for moving on iPhone app is really great for seeing where you've been and then experiencing the exploding star in the center, <laughs> a Lauren experience. <laughs> that Yes, the app is very handy and it traces your path so you can see where you've been. And then in the center it goes, woo. <laughs> so uh, thank you for a time for centering, very helpful uh, for those who can't walk. Yes, finger meditation tools, handheld labyrinths is another way of saying it is a very valuable tool. If we can't get out or we're not easily ambulatory, it's a great way. A Veritas offers uh, a free Friday afternoon walk every Friday. Uh, Barry, you're part of that. Uh, others on this call are part of that as well. It's free, uh, it's at noon, and then it's at four. And it depends because it's Pacific Rim and then the European countries. So we literally are doing this around the world. Sure, experiment with it, play with it. They're your hands, figure it out. I mean, don't be beholden by, uh, by what rule I would do. Uh, yeah, uh, just play with it, have fun with it. It's great to be ambidextrous, it's wonderful. And you'll get different information. You even, uh, we do recommend using your non-dominant hand. I don't think I said that clearly enough. Um, but also, uh, since you might not have as, as dominant a dominant hand, uh, you will, even if you use whatever hand, if you use a different finger, you get a different experience. See, so really play with that. Have fun with it. Other questions that could come on in here. The beauty of the music was so supportive and inviting tonight. And if you would speak to uh, the idea of music when we're physically walking with our feet or when we're uh, doing the practice on our own. Okay. Um, usually if you're at Grace Cathedral on the second Friday of the month, because we do a, a, a live walk there with live music, in-person walk, um, the music needs to support like Rob's wonderful music did. It usually not music that pulls you out and to your attention, but just holds an ambiance. Um, uh, uh, improvisational is best. And Rob, you were doing improv improvisational music, right? Um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, I, I enjoy doing that uh, because, um, well, I, I feel like it's a way for me to, to directly participate if I'm not walking uh, by just letting my heart and my imagination, uh, lead and guide. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in a way I, and I, that permits me to walk as well. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoy doing improvisation and I think you're absolutely right. The music needs to kind of support from underneath. And, uh, uh, you know, um, when we, when we walk here at home, we've got the, we have a river flowing not far from our place. And so there's the sound of the river and the sound of acorn woodpeckers. And there's the sounds of nature that are, that are their own music. Um, uh, but I think that makes a, 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 a lovely contribution to a walk to have some music, uh, in the background, but you're right. It needs to, it needs to not pull you out. It needs to help you settle in and ground you uh, in your walk experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. 
Um, there's plenty of information on the Veritas website, including uh, that we train people to introduce it to your community. Um, and, and that in the training, Tia, we talk a great deal about what music, how music, uh, you know, what music pulls you out. Cello pulls you in, certainly. Uh, classical guitar does not work at a labyrinth. It's too structured of the music. Non-metered music is best. Um, uh, so there's there's lots kind of behind the scenes, and, uh, and that's why it's always fun. Uh, labyrinth walks are always uh, fun to do. So thank, thank you so much for elaborating, so people can move forward with how best to use music if they choose to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, just, um, uh, you know, anything that's uh, gentle and quieting and just put it up on your iPhone or Spotify or whatever, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. So I love it too, Rob, when you use your voice. It's really lovely. Thanks. Yeah, you really do. And just, um, I guess maybe also a word about that if you, you know, if you're doing that. And so I was using very simple two word phrases, you know, O way, O truth, O light, O life, O love. Um, and, and uh, with the intention of n not, again, pulling somebody out with a story about my horse that ran off with my girlfriend and left me crying in my beer or something like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Things can go, go in the wrong direction pretty quickly. Uh, if you get too complicated with with a lyric, you know, so I think uh, even I know, um, um oh uh, singers who who don't who don't say words they say yeah. vocables they say sounds and and that works as well uh, mm -hmm. uh, it certainly does yeah. yeah it certainly does well it's been a joy to spend the evening with you folks Indeed. Uh, really lovely uh, thank you so much thank you and tia thank you for doing this amazing work through stanford you're welcome, and thank you, Lauren and Rob, for taking us into the experience of releasing, receiving, and returning. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>